Uh, annual calendar of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee forums. Uh, and we were hoping to see you all in person as well as online tonight, but uh, due to the rail strike, we've had to change the format of this event. Um, and the reason that's important is because the idea for tonight was it was going to be a lot more informal and relaxed. We weren't going to have that blue colour uh, cloth covered table at the front of the lecture hall where we're going to be sitting on comfortable uh, sofas and having a nice chat involving you as the audience um, as part of it. Unfortunately, uh, things have conspired us against us and we're now back to those um, heady days of Zoom webinars in lockdown. So um, well, we are going to try and bring everybody in as much as we can and I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to do that in a moment. Um, we're here tonight to talk about the important topic of social mobility and uh, in keeping with the informal uh, nature of tonight's event we're going to introduce ourselves individually rather than me doing it formally as a chair so uh, i'd like to first introduce uh, anna to you who will tell us about her anna thank you very much um it's a great pleasure to be here i have to say i was actually slightly relieved because i moved out of london four years ago when um I had twins and realized that London was quite unaffordable on an academic salary with twins. Um, so I was a little bit relieved I didn't have to come from Exeter to London, which is some of the balancing act with a lot of things. They're not black and white. Um, it does sort of work for childcare responsibilities to have it remotely, but you do lose an awful lot by not having it person to person. I'm professor of social mobility now at the University of Exeter. Um, I'm based in an education department. I have previously worked with the Bar Council and I have seen in, among the attendees, there are a couple of people I worked with on the Newberger implementation group back then. Um, I'm also a dual German British national. I mentioned that because that might come through in some of the things I say because there are different viewpoints on some of the issues depending on what national perspective you take. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. And uh, Helen? Helen, we can't hear you, I think. There you are. You'd have thought I'd have learnt by now. But anyway, hello. Um, I'm uh, Helen Mountfield. I'm a barrister at Matrix Chambers, and I'm also the principal of Mansfield College in Oxford, which um, we can talk about it later, but it's quite unusual in Oxford and Cambridge in that it's 96% state school and between 30 and 40% people who are first generation in their families of higher education. Um, and I specialised in uh, equality and diversity law, uh, among other things, when I was at the bar full time. Um, and I'm also a, a judge, in a few, a part time judge in various jurisdictions. And I have three children too, so I know how hard it is to travel and make all these things um, add up, although mine are older now. Thank you, Helen. Um, and I'm Chris Loweth. I am uh, a barrister, employed barrister member of Lincoln's Inn. Um, I'm currently uh, Director of Commercial Rights and Business Affairs for BBC News, but I'm here tonight in my capacity as Chair of the Inn's Social Mobility Subcommittee, uh, and I also sit on the Inn's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Um, so we want to involve you uh, watching as much as we can, and there's a couple of ways we plan to do that. The first is we're going to do a couple of polls and survey as we go along, uh, just to in ensure that you remain engaged, and we'll talk about how you respond to those. Um, the other way you can get involved is using the Q&A function, which hopefully everyone is more than familiar with by now. Um, we've disabled the chat so that we can focus on the Q&A, but that's for comments and questions throughout. Uh, Claire is sitting in the room with me from the inn and she will be monitoring those and if there are comments and questions that are pertinent to what we're talking about she'll interrupt me and we'll uh, try and answer those um, otherwise we'll deal with them at the end so please keep the conversation going um, as we do and then we can involve you as much as possible. So having said all of that uh, the title of tonight's event is social mobility where to start and where to find the answers so a good place to start seemed to me to be find out to ask our um, panelists what they understand social mobility to mean and what we mean by it when we talk about it so Anna what is social mobility? Um, so usually we mean by social mobility the movement of people from their occupational context of their birth family into a new occupational context. So technically this could actually be upward or downward social mobility. Um, it is associated with changes usually in social circles and 
may involve geographic mobility. Having moved from London to the southwest, I've really become very, very mindful of that dimension of mobility. Um, and probably that's something to consider for the bar as well, that aspect of geographic mobility that some work might entail. The policy focus has obviously been on upward mobility because everybody likes a good story, good news story, and on long range mobility, which is a bit, um, I read in a book recently, there are only seven stories of sto um, storylines of storytelling in literature. And one of these storylines is rags to riches. It's so powerful, we love it. So this is why the long range mobility story of someone born in quite poor conditions and having succeeded against the odds is one that captures our imagination again and again. And it is such a powerful storyline. And when you hear the individual narratives, they're so powerful. Unfortunately, it is actually quite rare. And I'm really glad that we are currently seeing a policy shift away from just that long range mobility of rags to riches, of someone quite poor and disadvantaged and making it to the legal bar. The bar is actually one of those social mobility professions and high status, high prestige, where we like to say, well, that's work. To think more, well, gradual movement is also social mobility. Or moving from being a teaching assistant to being a teacher, that's huge, that's life-changing. And that's probably more accomplishable by a greater number of people. So I think we are changing our policy focus, which may not be so helpful for today. I'm just throwing it out there. And then you have to indulge me with one more point on social mobility. Um, if I may, because I think we're not, we are moving quite quickly away from philosophical normative arguments about whether it's a good, bad thing or the, that sort of space. Um, but I'm really interested in the idea that if we think social mobility is about people with ability being able to live that ability to their full potential and accomplish a lot, I think we also need to be more radical and think some people are just born with a natural gift to work with children being really caring and compassionate. And as a society, we do actually need to rethink how we value all these skills that different people bring. That's so slightly outside the scope for today, but I think it's always good to open the debate a little bit at the beginning of these discussions. Well, and I think I'd rather have a much wider view of social mobility than a narrow one. Um, but Helen, we know what it is. Why is it important, particularly at the bar? Well, I think what Anna was saying is really interesting and important because actually when people talk about social mobility in the professions, they're not thinking about movement in both directions. What they're really talking about is a kind of equity that people with talent can overcome barriers of um, wealth or geography or um, social capital in a broad sense, i.e. contacts and, and know-how and achieve their ability. So it's talked about as, a, as an unalloyed good as equity. And I think, I, I think Anna's completely right that really some of what we should be talking about is, is a, you know, a good education and the talent and the luck and, and the structures to achieve it, what we should mean, because the rise of the meritocracy, which was a famous book of that title, was actually talking about whether that was a good thing. But we use meritocracy to mean the best people end up where they should be in fairness. And it doesn't always mean that. But that, I think that is a framing thing. But if we're talking about social mobility in the professions and the bar um, in particular, then I think it, it does matter. And it matters really, uh, I think I'd probably frame it in three ways. First, because of equity, because there is a sense that um, equality of capacity is something that you need to look at the barriers to that and how you can enable those with the talents in a particular profession that where there are more people who want to do the job than jobs to get in there and thrive on the, on their talents and a profession is seen better by society if, if, if it's perceived as as having that um quality to it I think it's also important um, for two other broader reasons. One is confidence in the legal profession, that if you've got people who are involved in the system of, of holding the ring and, and the parameters of justice, it really matters to society that broadly that system is seen to be one that encompasses the whole of society. And that I don't mean that you know, if you're a woman in a domestic violence case, you're not going to feel it's just unless you go into a courtroom and there's a woman there and you know she's a mother or she's the same the same ethnicity. I just mean that there needs to be a perception that that system as a whole is one that broadly reflects society. And, and finally, I think it does actually affect the quality of justice. And again, not because 
or people of a particular gender or racial group or sexuality think one way and one is more liberal than the other. But just because people do have different um, life experiences and approaches and you need um, those diverse experiences to rub up against one another, otherwise you have the risk of groupthink and, and people thinking that some ways of being unnatural because they work to them or are deeply unfair because they don't understand how they've come about. You can't talk about social mobility without talking about diversity generally. And I know it's one of our um, audience, Emma Reed Chalmers, has already said that it, social mobility also encompasses diversity. And I've heard it said that if you get your, uh, so your um, social mobility right, your socioeconomic issues addressed in an organisation, then your diversity will sort itself out. Because, and I know we're going to come on to talk about intersectionality, but social mobility encompasses such a wide range of people that you don't necessarily have to focus on one group. Whereas when we talk about other areas of diversity, you are by necessity often talking about different groups. Do we, um, how do we measure um, social mobility? It's already well about talking about it, but how do we see if it's, if it's working? Um, Anna, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, actually, just following on from the point you just uh, made there, and uh, that was raised by the audience, um, thinking about social class in organisations is relatively new. There was a book by Sam Friedman a couple of years ago that talked about the class ceiling, no longer the glass ceiling, this time it was the class ceiling. Um, and one of the organisations that has, for example, measured social class is PricewaterhouseCoopers. They are one of the organisations I know about that have done a survey looking at class. And they have looked at class pay gaps and they did find that class pay gaps were much bigger than gender and race pay gaps, which is the sort of retro way of saying traditionally we have looked, we have measured gender and race as traditional categories and possibly disability in terms of monitoring the composition of um, professions and of staff. Um, where possible and to get a fuller picture, we are looking at disability, parental occupation, high attainment at GCSE and A-level. For the bar type of school seems very important. Well, it is very important in terms of understanding the profession and in particular segregation or segmentation within, I shouldn't say segregation, sorry, segmentation, stratification within the profession and also career progression. Um, free school meals, entitlement, area level information, like index of multiple deprivation, parental ed education, care experience. All these things can be measured and could be analyzed with regards to professions and some of them are analyzed, which then already leads us on to two further points. One of them is intersectionality as, as already mentioned. So often they don't, they don't occur in isolation people, we all, multi-dimensional um, and I think and we're not quite there yet in the debates but I'm pushing this internally I think eventually where we want to end up actually is why we use all these as crutches to get us to be in a more inclusive space and to even just know who's in the room and what the issues are I think the long aim is really to be so inclusive and diverse that people with all sorts of barriers and opportunities can thrive in that context because there's a lot of unseen advantage and disadvantage as well and let's just think about things like bereavement or like experiences of abuse they cut across social groups and a slight concern of working in that space is that because there's so much action in the social mobility space that sometimes we end up in an unfortunate space where some of these sort of disadvantaged characteristics might be played out against each other which is clearly not where we want to end up so yeah. Yeah, well I, think, well, I think it's interesting that because the law has had um, protections for many years in relation to protected characteristics, we often think about those because that's how you can provide remedies for individuals or what is perceived as being easily measurable. Um, and often we use them for proxies. I mean, I've done it in, in cases concerning the public sector equality duty, that if you're looking at something that affects people who have less advantage, you can often measure that by reference to other protected characteristics, which are disproportionately connected with those um, disadvantages. But I think it's right that you can start to think about measuring, um, measuring socioeconomic disadvantage, and they usually have to be blended measures. So for example, um, at Oxford University, where 
there is a concerted effort, as there should be and needs to be, to um, promote the diversity of the intake. Um, there are now blended measures to try to look at some of those um, issues and people use um, postcode data to look at what proportion of people from a particular postcode progress to higher education. They look at school level data to see um, whether the number of people advancing to higher education from a particular school is what you would expect for a school with that characteristics. And there are other things like, for example, uptake of free school meals in particular schools, which are looked at. Universities used, also did used to look at um, parental professional background, and they're not allowed to do that now because of um, uh, data protection concerns, not on an individual level, but there are kind of blended measures of advantage. And you, I think if people are thinking about context when they um, make decisions of this kind, they can at least start to address these things in a qualitative way. But but I think you do need some data because otherwise I think it can be very stereotypical and you can make enormous assumptions about people which um, you shouldn't make in any direction. But I do think it is worth thinking about context when you're trying to achieve fairness and 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 get the best candidates for um roles in competitive places and competitive professions one of the things i found when i was reading around this subject for tonight is looking at the bars diversity report from um 2021 they started asking some of these more blended questions about social mobility and people won't answer them and I just wonder why that might be, why we've got 100% or almost 100% of people happy to answer questions on what sex or gender they are. And then when it came to the question on free school meals, I think the uh, response rate was 11%. And it makes it really hard to have, collect meaningful data if people aren't prepared to give you that, even in an anonymised survey. I just wonder, Anna, if you've got any thoughts as to why people are more willing to disclose some data about themselves than, than others and how we tackle that because we can't really tackle social mobility unless we know what the problem is in the first place. I, exactly, really good point. I have to admit, I haven't really got a really good insight. Maybe Helen has got one with regards to why people answer some questions and not others, but it is something we're really facing in the higher education sector as well because I, in preparation for tonight, I was just trying to look up some stats on higher education staff and a lot of it is like with even with regards to race a lot of this is prefer not to disclose so um it is difficult if you don't have your baseline data um i just wanted to make two more points on that and i think sometimes when you then look internationally it helps you to like see the familiar as strange or to think of things that we think we can't do that other people are doing them so and people in the room will know this better but my, my understanding is that south africa did make socioeconomic background a protect characteristic at least for time and also just to throw in another approach and I think it hasn't really worked but um, Germany for a long time I think that is the legacy of the Third Reich um, was trying a sort of race and class blind approach so there's actually very little data on the makeup of professions in Germany so Britain has got a lot more data it's gone down a data conscious approach which is turning out to be right because Germany is now waking up to the fact that actually there are issues um, once you start asking these questions um, it doesn't look dissimilar from the UK but just so to be mindful of the different approaches and maybe it is just about raising awareness of why we're asking them and why it's important and why it's helpful to know um, that it becomes sort of natural just like you answer other questions. Yeah. I mean I wonder if it has always been natural I think maybe people are used to the idea of of diversity monitoring. I think people were more reluctant to ask those questions before they were on detachable forms and it was made clear that they were anonymous. But that may also be a, why are you asking question? Because I have heard, including vociferously from a very senior judge, um, someone from a working class origin being told that it was ridiculous to her, for them to talk about class uh, discrimination because all barristers were by definition upper middle class. And I think that, that, you know, that sort of, for goodness sake, attitude to it, or I've pulled myself up my, my bootstraps, why are you interested where I'm coming from, may be part of it as well. Well, I think the bar has accepted it's an issue. Um, certainly Bar Standards Board and Bar Council are doing work to look at it. And I just wonder if we could take a minute to look at 
what organisations are doing. And I don't think everyone who's joining us tonight is um, either a barrister or in chambers or an employed bar. So we're going to do our first poll, hopefully. Uh, let's see if this works. And I'm just interested to know what your organisation, be that chambers, uh, an employer or another organisation, is doing to um, improve social mobility where you uh, are. So there's a number of choices there. Um, and these are things that have been suggested or that are, we know what other organisations are doing. And we're just really interested in you picking uh, one of these, if you're aware of what's happening in your organisation. I won't read them all out, um, but uh, we know that these are some of the things that organisations are doing. So please uh, choose one of those. Um, uh, or if you know that your organisation is doing uh, more than one, then there's also the option to say that you're doing a combination of two or more. Um, Helen, while people are voting, um, I know that Matrix Chambers is doing a lot of things. How do, you, how do you sort of go about, before we talk about what they're doing, how do you choose what to do? Because there's a lot there. Um, well, I mean, I think... It's something that's evolved over time. Um, and I think we have tried to look at some of the, right from the beginning, it was one of the core values of the organisation that we should be looking um, at fair access to the law. And by that, we meant for users of the law, which is becoming progressively difficult, but also to the profession and the jobs associated with the profession. So um, we have looked at some of the barriers to mobility. And one we perceived, and I see this when occasionally students talk to me about whether they might want to be barristers. They're convinced that you have to have done a mini pupillage in a lot of prestigious chambers and, you know, it'll count against you if you didn't and how can you afford to get to London and stay there and will you get in and will you be taken seriously? So we don't do mini pupillages um, and we, but we do have um, work placement schemes and we try to target those at people who aren't traditional entrants to the law. So we do ask people questions about their um, family background and you know professional background and for people from underrepresented areas or um, racial groups or disabled people because we want to actively I suppose give people that social capital and confidence that um, this is something that matters to us um, a few years ago we thought that despite our good words on this subject we hadn't done enough about racial diversity and we hadn't achieved enough we had tried but we hadn't achieved enough and we've taken really much more concerted steps and i think that's reflected now and more in the diversity of the people who work at matrix in various capacities but i think it's focusing on a problem and admitting it's a problem and that um goodwill and um fine intentions aren't actually enough sometimes you need to take active steps to try to change things let's have a look at the poll results I hope everybody can see those. There we go. So, um, an interesting mix. Uh, I think, unsurprisingly, uh, forty-six percent uh, are doing a couple of the uh, initiatives that we've listed there. Interesting. Nobody's doing guaranteed interviews for certain. Matrix groups. does do guaranteed interviews for people with a declared disability who meet the basic criteria for the job there's a, a sort of there's a threshold and then beyond that we do do um, guaranteed interviews um, for disabled and is there anything there that you are surprised by or that you think uh has been proven to be more effective than others and that we should be encouraging organizations and changes to concentrate on Anna, are you, uh... Sorry, the guaranteed interviews does actually seem like a <laughs> really good route, really good way forward. Um, so um, that seems like there's room for improvement here. Um, I'm also intrigued that two people have responded nothing. Um, hopefully that will change after today. Um, I think the issue of paid internships, mini pupillages is interesting. Um, I remember being really struck, like this is um, 10 years ago that I worked with the Newberger group around 10 years ago that and we looked at the um, access to pupillage. And what I remember, what I found really striking and shocking, and I still bring that into discussions when we talk about paid internships now, 
is obviously everybody is in favor of paid internships and I don't need to rehearse the arguments. But the challenge is that as an unintended effect, you might reduce the number of internships so much that then the competition for those few internships becomes so fierce that they, it becomes quite reproductive, socially reproductive, who gets those internships. So I think um, I would be, and this is again, and Helen, you, you will have a better solution, but my solution, this is the German coming through. I'm looking to the state here. I would love the British government to give every young person the right to do two paid internships wherever they want to do it and take their money somewhere. Um, and this is also, this is a tension in that space because as a profession, you've got things, you've got control over and that you can change. But I think there are some macro changes that really need to happen to be game changers in that field that are beyond what you as an individual profession can achieve. But Helen, you might have a more enlightened view on internships. No, well, I, mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would love that. Um, but I think, yes, I mean, I think that's one of the issues that sometimes you need to look at the shape of what you do and ask if you're going to need to change it so if you're aware that there is a problem of access to mini pupillage maybe that is something you shouldn't be assessing or you should be looking at other ways of showing interest in the profession rather than that when you're deciding who you're going to call for interview and i think it's very interesting that there's much higher on that little survey there was a much higher um, response in terms of outreach work than actually then measures you take to structure and maybe amend what you do and how your criteria work and maybe sometimes you need to take a, more of a punt on people at pupillage recognize because you think they may they have an aptitude and it may mean that there'll be more teaching to do during pupillage and that will be it won't just be in a, a year-long job interview it will be more teaching but you think someone has an aptitude and I do think um, so people sometimes ask the senior tutor at my college in Oxford, how come you have so many more people um, um, from from state school backgrounds and, for, and from underrepresented backgrounds, which are obviously not the same thing, um, at Mansfield and at other colleges? And she says, we take them. <laughs> you know, other people do outreach, they encourage, they say, do, do, please apply and we'll tell you if you're as clever as us, but we take them. <laughs> and they do just as well as anybody else. So, you know, I think it is about changing the shape of what you think it is you're looking for to respond to the way society sets up barriers in the first place. It's quite embedded in matrix changes, isn't it, Helen? Because you, I was reading, you take um, an intern every two weeks. Is that right? Two interns every two weeks. So there's, there's always people around. It's not something that happens just in, in I don't know, uh, in vacations. That's, that, that's school-based work placement. I think, you know, people just are, yes. Um, yes, younger younger people, and yes, we do, um, and it is an embedded part of of what we are because we are because we were set up by reference to core values. So then we kind of assess ourselves by what are we doing about them rather than are they on our website, and so we try to try to um, walk the walk. But that doesn't mean to say there isn't room for improvement. I think we have a reputation as being slightly smug, and I don't think we are. I think we do. You know, we don't think. Um, We've, we've achieved uh, fantastic social equity and are the answer to everything in the profession. But I do think we try and I do think we think about it on a concerted basis. I think financial support's really important. And I've seen lots more awareness now of the obstacles people might face even to do a work experience if they don't live in a city uh, or if they um, don't have someone to stay with, then just the financial burden of buying the right clothes so that they don't feel uh, conspicuous when they're in uh, chambers or an organisation, that their travel is paid for, that their lunch is paid for. All of these things can be taken for granted. Um, and at my organisation as well, we run a diversity uh, internship scheme over the summer where we ensured that people weren't uh, put off even from applying by not being able to afford to live in London for six weeks, uh, that they weren't going to have to shell out on certain clothes or food that they wouldn't otherwise have had to do. So that it's, you're providing the opportunity, but you're also assessing that they might have other needs that make it hard for them even to take out those opportunities. Yeah, I, I think that's important. And I don't know, tell me if I'm speaking out of turn, because I know you have a shape to this seminar, but um, there's, there's sort of let's let's break down barriers um and show you that we're very inclusive people is one thing and then there's taking practical steps to break them down and yes that applies to saying we'll find 
you know money for basic subsistence and travel expenses and we'll try and not privilege whether you were or weren't able to do that when we're assessing but then in the way that the profession works there are also issues like that um for example um uh, loans for people when they come back from periods of parental leave which didn't exist when i was in chambers and that was the most difficult part of my career when i came back from a long period of maternity leave where i had a gap in receipts increased expenses because of childcare and a, and a gap before starting to earn up again um enabled me to meet those expenses and it's the only time i've had a really big cash flow problem and i was really frightened about it and now when people have that gap in my chambers we we i mean there's obviously a period of rent free time but there is also uh, a loan to cover that period because we recognize that it isn't just straight back in and off you go um you know it really matters to think about both the practical and the attitudinal barriers that people have and, and how does it translate in matrix to who you then take on i mean have you seen a change over the years or where, where do your pupils and your tenants ultimately end up coming from i'm just thinking about measurement of the effectiveness of what you're doing um, uh, I, I think I think our racial diversity has improved. Um, I'm afraid because I'm not in full time practice now. I can't give you an honest, an honest answer to that question. Um, we've always we. I, I remember when we started, um, we, we 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 said we wanted the profession broadly to reflect society and as, aspire to being um, roughly half men and half women. Um, and somebody said, well, you know, you're setting yourself up to fail there. The legal profession isn't. It's not going to happen. Well, Matrix is. So, you know, I think, that, again, that's not the whole answer. We know what about pay gap equity? What about, you know, pressures are people getting fair allocation of work? And the bar as a whole is doing some much better work on, on trying to find data on fair allocation of work. And those are things that, that we discuss and where there may be, you know, again, I don't want to sound as if, you know, the, the world is all rosy and solved because I don't think it is. But we are, you know, that is something that we achieved by 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 setting out to think about it. Um, yeah, I would I, I wouldn't be able to tell you whether the, the 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 kind of people we take as pupils has changed over time. Trainees, we call them, not pupils. But, uh, yeah. Anna, do you? I mean, are there, are there things that work better than others? As, as Helen's been saying, it's, it's all very well having this range of things that you might be doing, but ultimately, is it getting anywhere? And which are the ones, if you were advising an organisation who's maybe a couple of people who said their organisation is doing nothing, what should they do? Well, I'm sorry, I'm not just going to say, oh, it's going to an outreach event, which would be a nice answer if I could just say there's like that silver bullet that fixes it. And um, because actually, I have to say that in higher education, in some ways, we've actually taken quite a few steps back in order to be able to move forward again, because there have been decades of throwing a lot of money at the issue of social mobility of finding access to higher education. And some of it has not been effective, like we couldn't demonstrate the impact it has had, um, because it's obviously a space where there is a lot of activity and a lot of passion and emotion. And I'm currently doing a little project where we're just mapping the social mobility space and we are up to 180 organizations currently have on our map that we're trying to say what, what role they play in that space and a lot of these organizations don't have an impact statement actually so where we have landed for now in higher education is going back and saying each activity should ideally have a theory of change of what you why are you doing it what are you trying to achieve and then measuring whether that's what you're achieving, which is partly going back to that point at the beginning about what is social mobility and it can mean different things to different people. And it can make possibly mean different things to different chambers if you're having those discussions internally. So saying what it is you want to achieve in your context and then saying how you would want to achieve it and then doing it and then achieving it, that seems like a really good starting point. Um, and in terms of evidence base, we're actually only now at a point where for higher education, we've got a center for transforming access and student outcomes, ASO, where we are collating the evidence of what works. And often so far, I mean, it does seem to be the more sort of sustained efforts, the sort of not one-off events, but um, uh, repeated interactions, uh, meaningful interactions with the same people. Um, and sort of embedded in some sort of sustainable 
framework. And also, I'm, I really like this idea of hot and cold information, because when you get your information through networks, through your social networks, that's hot information you get from real people maybe working in a profession or um, who have experience um, or can, can talk to someone who has experience, whereas a lot of those sort of students from non-traditional backgrounds rely on cold information on leaflets, on handouts, and this cold information is never sort of as good and as impactful for change. And then I throw in one last thing, because we've talked about social culture, uh, capital and cultural capital for many years, and there have been a lot of initiatives. One thing we are so currently piloting at Exeter and sort of trying to look into is that, <clears throat> it's not a completely novel idea, but the idea of future selves of sort of support, like just because we wanted another tool in our repertoire. And we were talking to students, um, possible higher education students in our area about the possible selves. And what I found really striking is that a lot of the drive to go into higher education was actually more likely to avoid self. So it wasn't, I'm going to higher education to be a barrister or to be socially mobile. It was just like, I've seen what my family is doing and what people I know are, are doing. And I don't want that future. I don't know what future I want because I can't envisage it because I haven't got enough information. I just know I don't want that. So a lot more work needs to go into that. Space. I think that I think that um, that hot and cold information idea is really important, and I feel into the whole idea of what is social capital and what is belonging. That there are people who feel that they belong and they have access to information and ideas, and people who just feels like a, a world away. And I think it is a sustained thing. If you want to make links, you can't just come once. You have you have to keep information and communication open, and and it's why I think the idea of, of regional equality and in not and the point that you made and I saw in the Q&A about you know, why do we think it's downward if you're doing um, a, a very important job but it's less socially valued it's less socially valued usually because it's paid less but it isn't a less socially valuable job so it does feed into the whole idea of of what do we mean by society you shouldn't be wanting to escape your background with one leap and have a different life but it's completely understandable in our current society why people do and then the other thing that I saw in the chat that I think is quite important is is thinking about how we can use the resources that there are in the profession to improve mobility so you know the inns of court have quite a few um, not very big bursaries and a very small number of large and prestigious scholarships well perhaps we can give the large and prestigious prestigious scholarship name to whoever you want to but but not that very large amount of money and make the um, the scholarship funding much more needs, how much you get in, in financial terms, much more needs based and you would spread out the, the, the money to enable people to get into this very expensive profession um, more and um, more widely. And means, means testing for scholarships, which I see is one of the suggestions that, that came through on, on the chat. Yeah. Um, Helen, Mansfield has got the highest uh, state sector school intake, I think, of all the Oxford colleges. Um, how do they do that? Um, well, that that word about sustained um, effort, I think, really matters because it long predates me. It's something um, that started, I think, about 25, 30 years ago with a real look at where is it that people don't come from <laughs> and why don't they come from there? Um, and uh, it started actually with some efforts in further education colleges um, initially because the perception was that that was where people weren't getting suggestions and support if they came in at 16 by the time somebody said have you ever thought of applying to oxford it was sort of too late for them to do it um but i i think it is about um using data making sure that people understand the context in which certain results have been achieved and trying to look for the best candidates with that context in mind. But I do think it's also an ethos and it's a shared ethos that I think it's something that people here across all sorts of subject areas are really proud of trying to do. And also to, um, there's a phrase I really hate in connection with elite professions like the bar and um, Oxbridge colleges when people talk about myth busting let's let's tell people why they're wrong to think this is an exclusive place and um, but I think what we have done almost in reverse is myth busting about the idea that you're either 
trying to improve um, the social diversity of your students or you're going for academic excellence because we've shown that the, the more diverse our student pool gets, the better they are, <laughs> the higher, the better the results they achieve. So these are not either or, these are a way of achieving meritocracy if that's what you want to achieve in a, you know, you know, are, are the cleverest people getting in and doing, yes, we think they are much more than they were when we weren't making those concerted efforts to overcome the barriers. And I think then the final thing is, um, and this is something I think for the higher education sector as a whole, but I'm involved, I'm just about to be involved um, as co-chair of a review board of a for, for an, um, an academic project that's looking at the underrepresentation of black British, um, Pakistani British and Bangladeshi British people in research degrees at Oxford and Cambridge, which is about 10% of the research degrees undertaken in this country. And I think one of the things that's really important, it's going to be a sort of what works over time um, piece of research and work sort of blended. But I think one of the really important things is to get away from a deficit model, get away from the idea that there must be something wrong with these people. Is it that they're not confident? Is it that they're not educated well enough before? What's wrong with us that we are not getting um, a representative sample of people because we assume that that, that um, aptitude and interest will be spread evenly across the population? And why is that not feeding through? And I think that's a really important mindset. It, um... The, uh, an event here at Lincoln's Inn um, a while ago, a big voice event, the chairman of the Social Mobility Foundation said the main barriers are financial, lack of proper advice and guidance in schools, lack of available work experience for the less privileged, uh, and the discriminatory selection procedures that still exist for some training contracts, privileges and tenancies. And I think that feeds into what you were saying, Helen, that sometimes it's about how do, how do we make people more like us rather than how do we change our perceptions and uh, assessment of what's what's what a good barrister looks like yeah and i think um that that's the other thing about well why would you want to and i meet quite a lot of people who say well you know uh, why would you want to go to oxford sounds awful um and i know of a um sort of um, magic circle law firm where they've taken on a reverse mentoring program where someone speaks to a senior partner to whom they are not working so they're not in hock to them and kind of gives them honest feedback about what's what's going wrong and somebody said um that their reverse mentee said it's absolutely dreadful in this place you sit in the you know while you're boiling the kettle to make a cup of tea and everyone's talking about their skiing holidays or what they were doing in mustique do they have any idea how that makes me feel you know i just feel so out of it i think i've got nothing to say to these people i've never been skiing i wouldn't know how you know, so it's just about what, how are you being that's making people feel I don't really want to be here. <laughs> um, well, that, that takes us kind of the next thing that I want to talk about, which is once we have recruited people and a more diverse range of people at the bar, how do we get them to stay? Um, and I think there's a number of things that affect this. Uh, but Helen, what do you think are the key the key factors that we need to think about in encouraging people to or ensuring people have the ability to to stay at the bar once they're there okay so i think there are some practical things like monitoring fair allocation of work uh thinking about the kind of support you give people in your charging structure and maybe loan structures at difficult points of their career like when they're just starting off when they're starting um, or, or when they're coming back from a period of sick leave or parental leave or something like that um, and I think there are things about making people feel welcome and valued um, and uh, some of that might be networks you know it might be having a, a, a chambers um, LGBTQ network or it might be or a women's network or, or you know a black barristers network or something like that but it's also about um, sort of signposting and signaling that you're interested and that you are engaged in these issues. Um, and then I think it's a it's the, the, there are roles for other bits of the profession. And I've, I've said this before, but judicial bullying isn't just bullying. If you're rude or dismissive to someone in court, it has a bigger impact on people who already feel outside and minoritized. And I remember being in court with a, a very, very good barrister um, 
male white male barrister who I know and the judge was being really horrible to him um, and we came out of court and my solicitor said wow that judge was really horrible to him I've never seen a judge be that horrible to a male barrister and I thought well, that's really interesting because now I come to think about it you know you you don't if a judge is giving you a hard time you don't think oh this is because he's sexist and I'm sure he wouldn't and would be outraged if he thought so but there's just a sort of in crowd out crowd way of talking sometimes by some judges and some make a huge effort not to be like this but there are things that if you complained you would never get through they're just slightly dismissive they're talking over you they're looking bored they you know it, it really really matters i think courtesy really matters to creating a more inclusive profession because discourtesy affects different people in different ways and do you have thoughts on this So this, this is clearly not my area of expertise, not being a practicing barrister, just sort of listening to Helen, it really resonates with all we know about professions, which is about cultures and pockets of cultures and having a sense of belonging. And this is, and now I'm gonna say something positive because I think today is meant to be about some positive take home messages. And this is sort of about like just be the change you want to see in the world, sort of. I know it's just a cliche in some ways, but it really can't beat it um, because it does come down to those micro interactions people have in their daily practice, in their let it be, I expect, with other legal professionals, um, but with judges in having micro affirmation rather than that micro aggression. If you hear quite often, well, you can do it and why not? That's really positive. And also um, something that Sam Friedman has said in his book and that um, I've said in other contexts is about um, unhide the hidden and formalize some of the informal practices. I mean, and again, things are not black and white because informal practices are often wonderful. Like in my department, we have tea at 11 o'clock every Wednesday and I think that's sacrosanct I always block that spot it's really important to have those informal meetings but when it is problematic is when those informal practices are exclusive when somebody and I do actually know that some of my colleagues who teach on a particular program can never come to these 11 o'clock meetings because they're always teaching at that time so they have got a separate meetup at seven o'clock in the evening which I can never go to because it clashes with bedtime so yeah they're always different considerations but if um, there is sort of a systematic way whereby informal structures are where maybe briefs are allocated where progression is discussed where opportunities are given then that is a space where on reflection one needs to formalize these structures and the hiding and the unhiding I find that is so important and I used to use the metaphor of an iceberg um, until one of my students pulled me up on it last year and she said I grew up this can come out um, over the wrong way but she said look I grew up, at, up in Devon I've never seen one I don't really know what this thing looks like can't you just talk about something I know and I was like okay let's talk about a tree roots you can't see them they're really important the tree wouldn't stand without them so all the stuff that you need to know that goes you think goes without saying and there is so much that needs to be spelled out. And I find that repeatedly, again, mentoring younger colleagues. Um, the stuff I assume they know is just incredible what they don't know. And that just shows me how much I need, like, we really need to explain all these practices. Yeah, I think cultural references are so important as well in terms of what you're talking about, your, your lived experience. It's often too easy to assume everyone's watch the same, same TV show as you, or read the same newspaper as you, or listen to the same music as you. And if you don't realise, and you do pretty quickly if you start talking to younger people, because if I'm talking about Faulty Towers now, they have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but you do need those to, to accept and find other ways to connect with people. And they may not have been skiing, they may not have watched Faulty Towers, they may not have seen an iceberg. Um, I want to talk about practice area because I think that's an important one as well but before we do uh just to engage everyone and um uh, who is at uh watching us at home um we've got another poll so um 42 percent I, I want to do the uh the, the third one if we can please Anna uh here we go so 42 percent of barristers who responded to the um bar diversity report survey I mentioned earlier 
um, work in commercial practice were educated in independent schools. And the question is, what percentage of respondents work in criminal practice? So just to recap that, 42% of barristers are um, educated in an independent school, went on to work in the commercial bar. What percentage of respondents work went on to work in criminal practice? That's um, respondents educated in an independent school? Yes. Yeah. Yes. As soon as I started putting these polls together and we're looking at stats, I instantly regretted it, but I've gone too far already, so we're going to stick with it. Um, uh, there's another stat that I, we didn't do, which was that 7% of children in England went to a state school, uh, compared to 33% of those who responded to the survey um, who went to an independent school. Uh, it just gives you an idea of the disparity. Um, We've got about half the people who've responded for so far, probably like me, they're struggling with a question. Um, so I'm just going to do it again. 42% uh, of barristers who responded to the survey uh, who worked in commercial practice went to, to an independent school. Of those who went into an independent school, what percentage went on to work in a criminal practice? That might have helped, it might not. Uh, I'll give it a couple more minutes. I mean, I think people can probably guess that where this is going. Um, should we end the poll? Five, four, three, two, one. So that's what people think that the answer is 24. It's actually 33% of um, those who responded, who went to an independent school, ended up in criminal practice. So I think our, our poll thought it would be actually lower than that, uh, which suggests that people already get the idea that state school educated barristers are more likely to be working in criminal and family, i.e. publicly funded, therefore lower paid practice areas than barristers from independent schools. And Helen, I know that you've wanted to talk about this as well, about the choice of practice area being really important for people staying at the bar. Yes, and I, and I think I, I think it is difficult for people to get started in those um, commercial practices. Often I find that people with less privilege in their backgrounds actually are more likely to want to be um, in a commercial practice because they think that will give them a kind of security. But it's the, the, the stereotype of what a commercial barrister looks like is um, much more is much stronger i suppose it's much less connected with day-to-day -day society you know people from all social groups um need family lawyers or, or, or criminal lawyers uh, lots of that is publicly funded and there's the perception that this is very very elite but i have also talked to people um i i, I was thinking thinking of a student who said that she went to a lot of um, applications for pupillage in commercial chambers which were very, very um, disproportionately male compared with a number of other chambers at the bar. And she said, why, um, you know, what, why are there not more women in the chambers? Which she said, it, initially, they, they sort of seemed to regard as a slightly hostile question. They said, well, women don't apply. And she said, well, here I am, I'm applying. I've got a first class degree. I've got a postgraduate degree from a prestigious American university. And that doesn't seem to be enough either. So, you know, um, why is it? And um, I think it's, there's an interesting question in the chat um, about um, judges' accents and not being able to think of a, at least a high court judge or who doesn't have a sort of RP um, or, or, or more accent. Um, you know, I come from a middle class family. I'm a, an utter chameleon. I, I have different voices, I think. I don't mean to, but I do because of where I went to school. Um, and when there were online hearings in the pandemic, my family, my children would laugh at me because they said I had a judge voice, which just went a little bit more clipped and a little bit more proper um, for the high court. So I think there is a sense of fitting in with this is how you talk in this context, and it can be quite exclu exclusionary. And do you think different practice areas have different um, different norms, different... Uh, uh, if we put 10 barristers in a room and you spoke to each of them, could you correctly identify which practice area they had come from, do you think, based on our accent, the way they spoke, the cultural references? This sounds like a leading question. I don't mean it to be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I think I could. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, well, what else is important about retention, about staying in a profession, particularly for self-employed barristers? Um, I was just sort of smiling to myself, a sad smile, because I remember all the debates about area of practice and also we ran regression models 10 years ago for the Newberger Group, um, predicting employed bar predicting um, being in um, family law. <laughs> And I mean, I was just really struck by how stratified the profession was because it was, it, the law for an outsider is a really fascinating profession because overall it's actually, it has quite a high representation of ethnic minorities and women compared to some other professions. So in some ways it's a good news story. And then the whole sort of dynamic within the profession once you get there is so fascinating. And obviously in other sectors, we see that stratification within professions as well. For example, in medicine, also to some extent academia. Um, but in medicine, there might not be the pay differentials attached to choices about areas of medicine. And in academia in the UK, not necessarily, there aren't necessarily those um, financial rewards and penalties attached to it either. But we do see a lot of stratification as well. So I'm in an education department, which is a highly feminized field. In the UK, we are on the same pay scale as other departments, whereas in the US, education departments all get paid less. So there's something about there's something outside the debate about the stratification within the profession about why it is that commercial law should uh, draw such a high premium in pay compared to family, compared to crime. Um, that's not for us today, but it's just generally, there's no obvious reason if it requires the same skills, why we should reward it so differently. Of course, it's a free market. So coming back to your question, Chris, about what are the other barriers? Well, I think we've talked about them, and Helen, you've touched upon this. You returned after maternity leave to a self-employed profession. That seems like the maternity leave does seem like a great challenge, um, generally. And of course, again, there are macro issues because well, I, I just I find it bewildering looking at countries like Germany, where maternity pay comes out of tax money and you get 80 percent. It's capped at a level of your previous salary, regardless of whether you're self-employed or employed. You get that money for a year and it, um, the male partner takes uh, or the other partner takes four months. You get 12 months pay. So there is sort of an incentive built in that you split the, um, uh, the leave. I know that this is not your gift as a profession to change policy in that area, but it is just shocking. And I, I don't know what the solution is, but I can see why women might be leaving the profession at that point when they realise that there isn't really uh, pay and support in place. Um, uh, I think I think I'll leave it at, at that point. Uh, yeah. These issues aren't just relevant to to retention, but it's progression as well, isn't it? Because when we look at, and I'm going to do our final poll, because uh, they're proving so popular, um, uh, which is, you now this is based on a survey that was 2019, so apologies if these figures are slightly out of date. This is, again, just to uh, provoke discussion, not to prove or deny anything. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, uh, um, about 34% of the bar who responded said they went to an independent school compared to 7% of the general population. But what percentage of the senior judiciary, according to a 2019 report, uh, went to an independent school? I don't have definition for senior judiciary, so please forgive me. Um, it means high court and above. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, the options are 7%, 35%, 53%, or 71%. And this is a quick poll. So once we're at 75%, uh, we've got a clear winner. I don't know if you can see how people are voting as we go along. Uh, if you if you, you can't, but uh, yes, no surprises. I think we can probably end the poll uh, and, uh, and share the results. Uh, yes, 71% of the uh, senior judiciary were privately educated, according to the 2019 report produced by Geoffrey Bynum Casey and Karen Monaghan Casey. And in addition, at that time, 10 out of 12 Supreme Court judges had been privately educated. Helen, is this something you've got thoughts on as how we get people into the profession, keep them at the profession and then progress them into more senior roles within it? 
Well, I think firstly, we need to understand that that is a problem and it's a problem for the reasons that we talked about because it is not the case that 71% of the people with an aptitude to be a high court judge went to independent schools. It doesn't, um, it, it enables people to ca characterize judges as out of touch, which is bad for respect for the profession. And I think it's bad for the quality of justice because people don't have, um, a, there, is, there isn't the, the risk, there isn't the, the diversity of thought, which you get from people from different backgrounds, um, exchanging ways of thinking. Um, and I think, so you need to recognize that it's a problem and then to use um, the lovely sociological words that somebody in the Q&A has used, you need to change the habitus. You know, you, you the judges need to recognize that you are presenting a culture and you're asking people to come into it and it's frightening and it's alien and it puts people off. You know, the, 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 rob, the real problem is you don't have to be, you know, it, it, it isn't the case that if you are, you know, if you might be a very nice, um, white male, um, non-disabled, um, public school educated judge and say, well, there's nothing I can do about it then. Well, there is, you can be, you know, you can be, you can be welcoming. You can remember to be polite. You can remember to be encouraging and you can recognize that it's a problem. And if you don't recognize that it's a problem, then you're part of the problem, I think, you know, and I think that's, it's, it's just that you need to be aware that this is a really exclusionary, um, issue. And it's, it makes the legal profession feel remote and out of touch. And that's, bad for society and it's really bad for the legal profession too. And there is there a similar problem in higher education? Um, I mean, because we are more heavily regulated, you have to tell me what your equivalent is in your field. I think we've been really fortunate that we've got a regulator that's come down quite heavily and quite strongly on institutions saying you've got problems you need to fix. So once the attainment gap between white and BAME students was brought to the attention of the sector, um, universities basically have benchmarks and targets. And because we are assessed through a mechanism through the teaching excellence framework, we have to justify why there, if there are gaps between our students, why there are gaps. So, and that goes back to Helen's point about shifting the discourse from a deficit or from a discourse centered on individuals to institutions. So we are no longer talking about an attainment gap, we're talking about an awarding gap. So it's the institutions that need to change what they're doing there. So, and it is working because it's made it core business for institutions to change their practices really rapidly. So I actually really believe that these policy mechanisms, they work, targets, benchmarks work if they've got teeth. Is there something in your sector that could provide that role that could fill that? Is it the Judiciary Appointments Committee? I mean, I don't, I simply just don't know enough about the mechanisms of how this would work, but clearly there is space okay. for, for those mechanisms to come in and just say, you just can't do this, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. can't have you can't have that percentage of independently educated judges. It just doesn't work. There's no government regulator in the way the um, Office of Students works for higher education and directs institutions to address it. But obviously we do have the Judicial Appointments Commission and the Bar Standards Board and the Bar Council who, who do mandate this. But I don't think they, and Helen, you might know more about this, they are taking an awful lot of action. And I would encourage everyone watching, if you've not looked at the JSC or the BSB's websites and, and just search for diversity on them, there's a lot of resources there. Yeah. But in terms, so there's action to be taken, but as, as, as you were saying, Helen, I think it's about how the people applying feel as to whether they will, even if they get there, whether they'll be welcome once they are there. Yes, and that's, and that's you know, you can't if you're white and public school educators and you're a judge because you think that's an important job to do, you, you can't change who you are. You can make sure that you're part of the welcoming and it's not all down to, you know, well, I won't be a role model, so I'm not part of any of this everyone is part of it and you know I, I used to sit in a courtroom where I regularly went uh, a, a, on a, a circuit courtroom where I was regularly the only woman in the lunchroom I just think you know it's it behoves a room full of white people to know what it feels like to be the only black person in the room or a room full of men to know what it feels like to be the only woman in the room and I did very recently go to a an event in Oxford for um launch of some scholarships for people um pakistani origin and 
it was a, you know, a, a vastly Pakistani major, origin majority room with very few white people in it. And of course, if I wasn't in my hometown and my country, I would sort of, I would expect it, but I just thought, wow, I have to remember this. This is what it feels for most black and brown people in Oxford. It wasn't, it wasn't that I felt discriminated against. I just felt other. And I thought, you know, that's, that's how it feels. Just, just remember this feeling because I can talk about it as a woman in the law and what it feels like to be a minority, but this is, I'm used to being um, a racial majority in Oxford and it, it, it was just um, good for me. <laughs> I just thought this is, this is, you know, it's just not nice when, when, you're when, nice. and, and then, you know, you're, you're, you're just, you know, you're just slightly other. Um, we are fast approaching our end of our allotted time, and I want to just take some time to have a look at the questions we've got. Um, one that has come in uh, is about, we've, we've talked a lot about some of the initiatives, uh, particularly policies promoting social mobility, guaranteed interviews, applications, SIF quotas, other measures, but some chambers are reluctant to take those on. How do we persuade them um, to, to, to adopt some of these policies, other than obviously watching this seminar back? Helen, do you have, I mean, you well, talked about well, the constitution. It depends, what dri to... it depends what drives them. But because I see a lot of student lawyers, I also see what the big law firms with very big budgets for recruitment are doing. And they are all um, bending over backwards to demonstrate what they're trying to do to be more diverse and inclusive, partly because they think they won't get the best candidates if they don't. And a lot of students say to me, oh, I think the solicitor's profession is much more equal and diverse than the than the bar. And I ask them why, and it is usually because of outreach materials they've seen. Um, so, you know, what you say to people about what you want and how you demonstrate that kind of matters, because actually I'm not sure that is true, but um, maybe some bits of it that make things easier. But, it, you know, I, I think the way you talk and the what and what you say you want matters and i think so if you if people say there's no appetite for that you say well we lose the best candidates if you don't and do people believe that or do they think the best candidates are the people they've got already that's the real problem they usually think the best people are <laughs> them and people like them so well, i guess it depends on how they define who the best people are as well exactly anna any thoughts on that yeah, just uh, echoing this, I think going for the business case for diversity it seems much more promising. And I think this is how universities have reframed that um, agenda as a business case. It's not it's not a woolly sort of fluffy add on. It is absolutely our core business. But I think we have been helped by the regulator making it our core business. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, another of the questions uh, which we did touch on earlier, but I just wondered if we'll any more thoughts? What's the best way to collect useful data on socio-economic background? Anna, because we talked about a couple of the standard questions that we're probably all used to seeing when we fill in these surveys. It, it's a blend of questions, I'm guessing. Yeah, so UCAS, they have like what they call a basket of measures, so they have a range of measures. Um, and I know, I remember from the Newberger work that people were quite keen also to point out that private schools do have scholarships and that sometimes when you see private Edu privately educated um, uh, young children rising through the ranks and professions that it is they might have actually been that scholarship person. Um, so um, postcode is really popular because you can map this onto IMD. Um, parental education is um, really popular. So whether they are graduates or not. Um, I was actually, I didn't know this, Helen, but Helen said um, about social, like occupation not being permissible anymore. I mean, this is something we used to look at all the time and ask about all the time, or maybe I misunderstood um, that point. I don't, I think there's a problem with that, or I was asking on an individual level about free school meals, except on an in, a individual basis. I think the most important thing about measuring this is that it's something that the um, Bar Standards Board makes a recommendation on and everyone does the same way. I remember um, before the b before the public sector equality duty came in, being on a um, working party looking at um, equality in the inns of court. And one of the problems, if you try to say what proportions of students from different ethnic backgrounds get scholarships in different inns, was that everyone measured these things 
in different ways. So I think what's important is to agree a measure and then use it um, on over a number of years and on a universal basis so that you can compare things and not say, well, we don't really have any data that means anything. Um, we're there, I think. Uh, so that's social mobility sources. I think people <laughs> feel that they do have some, uh, some where to start points from this. Um, before we go, Anna, is there any closing thoughts you have that you'd like to share? Just be that change you want to see in the world. I think that's what it boils down to. It's those micro interactions and micro support for others that make all the difference. While Thank campaigning you. for system change, I would say that as a sociologist. Thank you, Helen. Yes, mine would be thank you for attending. I think people who stick out um, this are people who care about it and that matters. And um, that uh, sociology phrase, you know, ch change the habitus. Th don't, don't say we are really welcoming. We want to promote access to our profession as it is. Ask what it is, it, is it in the profession that is preventing fair access to it? Couldn't agree more. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much for your time tonight. It's been really interesting getting your thoughts um, and thank you also to you uh, watching for joining in. I'm sorry we didn't get to go directly to a lot of your questions but I have been trying to weave in as much of the points that you've been making into our questions into our chat and I know Helen and Anne have been doing the same as well so um, even if we haven't directly referred to your question we have read them and, and tried to think about them. Um, we're going to send um, a whole bunch of resources out uh, to everyone who attended this seminar just so that there are things you can continue reading um, and draw on in your own uh, efforts in your organisations or chambers to improve social mobility. Um, and had we all been here in person to now, we'd all have moved to a different room and have been able to carry on the conversation over a drink. We're not be able to do that, I'm afraid, but I hope that this isn't the end of the conversation. Um, and thanks enormously to the Inn for hosting this as well, because the Inn really is committed to social mobility as well. Um, as part of our EDI uh, programme of events, there's a few things to uh, just promote before we finish tonight. Uh, the first is if you are a member of the Inn, you will hopefully have received an email from the treasurer today reminding you to complete your EDI survey if you haven't already. We have had a uh, surprisingly low response rate so far and we really need it to be much higher if it's going to be uh, of use to us in enabling us to work out what we need to do at the end to tackle inequality uh, and also any issues issues of discrimination or bullying or harassment uh, across the inn. So please complete the survey if you haven't done so already. Um, if you want uh, another opportunity to connect with the inn, then there are two more events coming up before the end of the year that I'd like you to be aware of. The first is the Samota Singh Memorial Lecture, which this year is being, um, being held by Stephanie Boyce, who's the president of the Law Society on the theme of making justice seem to be done, putting diversity at the center of the rule of law. That's on Thursday the 10th of November, and you can see more details on the in website. It's also followed by a donor's dinner, which is another good example, a good opportunity to mix with and meet lots of different people in the inn. And then finally, our keynote speech this year is uh, going to be given by the Right Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, MBE KHC, uh, Bishop of Dover on Wednesday the 30th of November. That's open to everyone, regardless of whether you are a member of the or not, and you can find more details on the website. Um, thank you again, Anna and Helen, for your time tonight, and thank you everyone for joining us, and we hope to see you at the Inn very soon. Good night. Thanks, Chris. <laughs>